Hear now the word of the Lord from Judges chapter 6. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would camp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. At the end of Judges 5, everything's going great in Israel. Deborah has defeated Sisera, and there's 40 years of peace. The bills are paid, the kids behave, the business is going great. Everything seems to be coming up roses. But we know that when times are good, Israel tends to forget God and turn to evil. And so God shakes things up by allowing Midian, this foreign power, to rise up against them to show them how hard life can be without him. Every year at harvest time, the Midianites would come down and they would ravage the land like locusts, destroying everything they couldn't carry. Many of the Israelites, we just read, in fear would flee their homes and head for the hills to live in the caves. This goes on for seven years until finally Israel wises up and they cry out to God. Seven years. And then God responds immediately. He sends this unnamed prophet to bring the people back to God. And then God also raises up this new deliverer, this new judge whose name is Gideon. Look at verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah which belongs to Joash, the Abbey Ezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, and the broth he put in a pot, and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes, and put them on this rock, and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and fire sprang up from the rock, and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord, and he called it Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is peace. And to this day, it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abbey Ezrites. So Gideon is a pipsqueak from a pipsqueak family in a pipsqueak tribe. And yet God chooses him to lead Israel out of the oppression of the Midianites. 
the angel calls Gideon a mighty man of valor, and I'm sure after looking around to see who the angel might be talking to, Gideon tries to change the subject. Hey, angel, if God is for us, how come we're under all this oppression? Where's the God our fathers told us about, the one who led us out of Egyptian bondage? And did you notice that the angel of the Lord doesn't answer the question? Instead, he calls Gideon to action. He says, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And surely Gideon's wondering, might? What might? I'm the least. Not with God on his side. And Gideon asks then for a sign and says, wait here. And the angel says, I'll wait. Gideon brings out the goat meat and the bread, and the angel says, put it on the rock and pour the broth over it, and fire jumps from the rock, consuming the offering, and then the angel vanishes. Gideon realizes that he's been in the presence of God. And so that was the first sign. Gideon then asks for two more signs that involve fleece and the morning dew. And after God delivers on those, finally Gideon is convinced that God really is with him. He puts his faith in God, believing that God will use him to defeat the Midianites. I just want to give you a couple of quick points from the text, and then we'll be done. Number one, you and I need to see that God indeed uses suffering as a means to get our attention, or means whereby we can see how much we really do need God. Isn't it something it took Israel seven years to realize how much they need God? And so, how about us? How often do we experience hard circumstances and we refuse to consider that God has a plan for us in those circumstances? Instead, we kind of hold out. I'll handle this one, God. I got this. And the fact is, we don't got this. We need God's help in every circumstance. There are others who would even blame God. Why me, Lord? Why am I suffering? Folks, life is a test. In the good times, will we be thankful? Will we give the glory to God? Or are we going to steal the glory for ourselves? When bad times come, when suffering comes, will we even stop to consider that maybe this is God at work? That he's trying to draw us nearer to him? Will we ask him for help instead of trying to fix everything by ourselves? See, when tough times come, and I do believe they are coming, may we see them not as God's punishment, but as a gift of grace from God. Proverbs chapter 3 says, Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline, for the Lord's discipline is for the one he loves in the same way that a father disciplines his son in whom he delights. See, God loves us too much to allow us to get comfortable in our circumstances and in our sin. He demands to be at the center of our very lives, and he will allow us to suffer if that's what it takes to bring us back to him. Our sufferings are always for our own good. C.S. Lewis, the great theologian, said it like this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. Pain is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. The second point I'd like to make tonight is we need to see that God loves to use nobodies, nobodies just like you and me, to accomplish his purposes. One of the biggest lies we tell ourselves is that God only uses special people. Well, guess what? We're not special. None of us is. But because you and I are in Christ, we are God's justified, redeemed, and saved children. We are spirit-filled citizens of heaven. God is with us, he's for us, and he's in us. And we need to start living like who God says we are. We must live to our true identity because God has plans for us. God calls us and he equips us for whatever task. And we might have doubts about our abilities, and that's okay. As long as we understand that with God on our side, our lack of talent and ability just don't matter. 
Think about it. God took this hundred-year-old idol-worshiping Chaldean and his barren wife and made them the forerunners of a new nation. God took an 80-year-old sheep herder and turned him into a miracle-working deliverer. Jesus used fishermen and tax collectors and tent makers to turn the world upside down with the message of the gospel. So just think about all you and I can accomplish, not by our power, but by the power of Almighty God. And so may we surrender to his will. May we willingly go wherever he calls us, and may we tap into his limitless power as he uses us to bring about his purposes in the world.